Can I just uh, mention one thing? A, a lot of your talk uh, focused on uh, cultural uh, speciesism, and uh, you've made references to uh, other cases throughout history, like uh, racism, sexism, and homophobia, and all that. Uh, I'm wondering, how, how, to what extent do you think it is cultural, or do you think a lot of it could be um, perhaps uh, biological, in the sense that we're hardwired as a species to uh, discriminate against the other, as it were? Uh, probably the most salient uh, example would be human, non-human animal. And uh, perhaps we're limited in our capacity to, uh, to change uh, or to convince people okay, that was, uh, against the us them barrier. So I'm kind of concerned about uh, how much we can actually do. Yeah, well, um, and a, a, another good question, and in and, and the sense is that as a sociologist, I would resist the hardwired. Uh, yeah, uh, biological uh, determinism yeah. and everything else like that. And so we, we, we would kind of look at the idea of you know, society being you know, a social system in which people are born into it. You know? And so you're born into a species society or you're born into a racist society. Mm -hmm. So you know, the people born into apartheid South Africa were born into a very racist society. And when I was working as a projectionist near London, uh, this, this guy came over from... South Africa, and he still just automatically regarded people of, of colour, he called them Kaffirs, because that's how we were brought up. So the argument is that if you're brought into a world in which the values are different, then your own values will be different, because as I said, that most people are conformists. So there is always that issue, that if you've got a good society, this is a kind of Marxist point really, if you've got a good society and most people conform to it, you know, and uh, I mean Marx really wanted kind of a, like um, he wanted like a, a population of rebels to bring about the revolution, and then after that you need a population of conformists because they realise then that the new society is grand and everything's fine. Yeah. So I would resist the hardwired thing as, as a sociologist. Uh, not completely. I mean, obviously, biology We're on there. as well. So we're, we're, we're not yeah. fundamentally that different. Well, I think it would be a good thing for most people to recognise that they're animals, which, is, which would be a good step forward from, from our point of view because people tend not to self-identify as animals or as mammals, or as apes. We tend not to do that. No. Sorry, it's just related to, to Martin's question and to your reply. I think that uh, in Bourdieu's theory, we could find a sort of a middle ground uh, uh, between sociology and uh, uh, ethology, let's say, because of the idea of habitus and such as, as and has something to do with instinct, uh, and would you say is a social instinct sometimes. So I think that um, as we are social animals uh, and cultural animals, yeah. uh, our habit uh, can be defined as cultural and biological with the term uh, social instinct. Yeah, and so I, what I, do I you think of the, this? the shape of the society you're born into would play a big thing. And of course, you can add to that what Bauman said in his presentation, which is that we're almost instinctively moral as well. He, yeah. he claims that by just looking into the eye of the other, I mean, think about live aid, right? You look into the eyes of the suffering of another, then that creates morality, he, he argues. And that's why, of course, a lot of animal advocates they would focus, I'm going to go here, would focus on great apes or on apes, yeah. because they look so similar, okay, so you can look them, as it were, in the eye, but if you go on Facebook, you'll see a lot of pictures, you just have the eye of a cow, and the, the eye of the horse, and people are saying, look, you can see the suffering, you know, yeah. so empathize, and so I think that that can be regarded as an instinct, but obviously the, the society can squash it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, when you're talking about animal equality in this way, you're, um, one group you're excluding is other, other forms of life outside humans and not humans, the plant kingdom, for example. And um, you know, the reason most people give is that these plants can't feed and not scent it. But it's kind of it, the line gets a bit blurred somewhere, you know, somewhere. Oh, well, that's more the enemy. Yeah. 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 And, um, mollusks or bacteria, that kind of thing, so. Yeah, but well, Richard Ryder always argues that animal rights involves both line drawing and also grey areas. And what Reagan says is that if you're going to draw lines, then do it with a pencil because it's going to change. But, that, you know, there are, there are issues about that. 
you know. And uh, I suppose going back to Maureen's presentation, if, if you look at the, the deontologists, then Reagan's got a different formulation to say Francio, who brings it back to sentience, whereas Reagan's got a more complicated idea of subject of a life. But, but they, you know, Francione is very unwilling to go into insects, uh, as it were. This is not a bestiality thing or anything. Um, but, and, uh, but, you know, but whereas Joan Dineo would do that, and so she's kind of the insect right person, and that's why her stuff is not very popular within the social movement. Because people think, geez, you know, how can we advocate for insect rights when, when we don't have rights for great apes and, and, and the ones that people do empathise with? And so there's a, a thing there. And so the, the boundary of our concern is different. <coughs> I agree with that. I think what, what you would do then is just have a, a bit of a recipe of, of issues. So you'd have maybe an environmental aspect. You'd have a conservation thing with regard to the plant life and, and everything. But it wouldn't necessarily be part of strictly an animal rights argument. You'd have to probably have a, a, a mesh of the two. Although I suppose eco-feminists would argue that they would kind of try to bring all these concerns together. Yeah, just actually on that point, you know, when I was talking about the amendments to the Bolivian and Ecuadorian constitutions, mm. um, Ecuador has actually granted rights to crops against being genetically modified. Oh, right, okay. Right. So, yes. yeah. Should crops have standing? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Which is the last question here. Okay. You use the term uh, cultural species, and I wonder if you see species as being fundamentally cultural in nature, or has it been brought in already? Are there other, other elements at play generated? Yeah, I think there are other elements, but overwhelmingly perhaps um, cultural, uh, in, in the sense that, you know, as a sociologist, we, we would look at how socialization processes are very strong, and that means that generation after generation, we are bringing forward societies which are speciesless, and that means. Therefore, you've got a kind of problem because right from the start, people are regarding, uh, you know, it's kind of a human supremacist kind of ar argument, but the humans are right up here and other animals are here, and then you've got a bit of a kind of hierarchy situation. So there's a bit of a kind of sliding around. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say it's probably overwhelmingly cultural. And in some senses, sociologically, that's the hope of it, because if it is, we can do something about it. If it's hardwired, then it's harder. And we have to, I don't know, eliminate some people or something like that. I, I didn't say that. Um, yeah, maybe we could do that. Yeah, we could hybridize them. So, yeah, I'd like to thank Roger again for. Uh,